Hello, so uh, my name is Stian Thorsen. Uh, I'm the co-lead on Keycloak. So Keycloak is uh, quite a new project from uh, JBoss, so obviously open source as you would expect. Um, it was started about six months ago. So basically what it is, is uh, an authentication uh, server. So at the core is OAuth 2 for those that know about OAuth, that's kind of you know, a lot comes from that. Uh, so basically the uh, kind of the reasoning behind this project is because um, the traditional way of doing authentication where you have like a standard Java EE way where you have a, a valve that looks at the username and password and uh, talks to a single database and it's all you've got HTTP basic or something. Um, works fine when you have uh, a single server and uh, traditional server side uh, application, a web application. But once you start getting uh, cloud into the mix and clusters and you get mobile phones and you get client side so some like file applications, that kind of becomes more hard than that traditional approach where, where OAuth uh, helps you to, to do all that and also it lets you to let third party applications basically um, access your your applications. So I'm not gonna go much into detail about OAuth 2 or um, about why you need Keycloak because this is basically just an introduction to Keycloak and what we have now. And I'll kind of let you judge your own opinion whether or not this is something you need and this is something that will help you. So I'll literally just dive straight into the features that we have at the moment. So what we do is that you don't literally have to do anything with regards to authentication. It all comes from Keycloak as a service. And we provide SDKs for, for JavaScript and for Java EE applications. And, and uh, you know, we want to provide uh, SDKs for other languages as well. So for uh, Ruby or for Vertex or Node.js or whatever it is that you use. It should be really easy to use. And it should be a matter of, so it's not a framework. We don't want people to have to build their own stuff. It's service. You configure it, right? It's easy to use and it's straight out of the box. So that applies to even things like the login forms. Uh, so we don't want you to have to create your own login form because you start out with a login form, it's a username and password on it, you know, a submit button. And then you realize, well, hang on a minute, we need to have social login. We need to allow users to register. We need, to, you know, people need to manage their accounts and so on. And it kind of adds up. And before you know it, you've created a lot of stuff in something that you thought would be a simple thing. So, that's why we kind of do the login forms for you. And as part of that, obviously, you want your login forms to, to fit in with your applications. So we try to make it as easy as possible for you to kind of style them, uh, to make them well integrate with your applications. And you can do that through uh, just pure style sheets, so CSS, uh, which means that you don't even have to have a developer involved. You can get your web guide to do it for you. Uh, which I'll show an example here. So basically, so this is the standard Keycloak login form, right? With a big Keycloak logo and stuff. And you don't, you don't want that when people log into your application. So you get what your web guide to basically team it for you, right? And this is done by our web guy, and he doesn't know a line of code, and he you know, made it look completely different. That's not to say that you can't dive in, you can write your own templates, and you can rip it all out, because we want also to once you start getting to, you use Keycloak and you realize that this piece doesn't really work for me, you can rip that out and replace it with your own piece, right? So you can build this from scratch if you wanted to. You know, if you're six months down the line of having put it in production, you realize that it doesn't do exactly what you want, right? So uh, you can rip it out or you can ask for a feature or you can, you know, do a pull request in GitHub, right? Because it's open source. Um, so next feature, right, so single sign-on is quite important nowadays, right? You want people to have a single password for all their applications to be able to log in to many applications at the same time, right? So even today, Red Hat, we still don't have single sign-on throughout uh, the various different applications internally. Um, and we hope that this is the kind of product that would make it easy for, for everyone to build that into their applications. 
So again, registration forms, we provide that. They're, again, they're configurable, right? So this is just an example. You'll be able to just go in and say, right, I don't need a last name, first name will do. I need a date of birth. You know, a uh, date of birth should have these and these validations and that. It's all done through our admin console, right? So you don't have to write the logic yourself. So we also have these account workflows. So basically actions that users are needed to do, right? So it could be anything to like one day you introduce, you say that you want users want the date of birth and most of your users haven't provided one, right? So you just say, next time users log in, they'll have to provide you with date of birth, right? So that's the, they'll have to update their profile. Or if you want to reset your passwords, right? Because you've got a, has you know, you've got a security breach or something, right? You can just reset all people's passwords. Not that that would ever happen with this product, obviously. But, um, so, and then next time they log in, they'll ask to update the password. It might be setting a longer password. It might be, that you decided to enable multi-factor authentication, right? So a password isn't enough nowadays, right? So you, you, in the beginning, you think, well, password's enough. You know, we don't want people to have the hassle of, uh, of two-factor authentication. And then you realize, well, actually, the stuff that our pro application provides is very sensitive, right? So we'll actually force all users to use uh, two-factor authentication, right? So you just click the button. Next time users uh, log in, they're asked, you know, you have to set up uh, some form of a multi-factor authentication, right? So here's an example of a user logging in where, where the admin has reset the password and he's basically being told that your account is disabled, uh, you'll have to update your password and uh, then you'll get to be logged in. So as is the service, we want everything to be managed through REST, right? So REST endpoints for everything. And and an extensive HTML5 console to make you to be able to do whatever you want just by the click of the button, basically. And obviously, the REST endpoint lets you do it through whatever programming language you want, um, and you can automate it, right? So, as an example of our admin console, I'll show more of that later throughout the demo. But uh, you can see already this is early version, and we already have loads of options and loads of things that you can do through the admin console. Right, so as I said, often passwords isn't enough anymore, right? So multi-factor authentication is quite important, right? And we want to provide many ways for people to, to do multi-factor authentication. So that could be uh, verification codes through SMS, or it could be, you know, like Google Authenticator on your phone, uh, could be an email, right? And you want to be able to provide your users an option of, of having an additional proof that they are who they say they are. So, as an example of setting up uh, Google Authenticator, right? So on login, you are set up Google Authenticator before you log in. We also allow logins by social media, right? So you don't have to have, uh, you don't have to set a username and password. You don't have to register. You just click the button, let's log in with Google. And uh, that's it, right? You log in, uh, we pull your details from Google and there's no password, right? You just log in via Google. And so at the moment, we support GitHub, Google, Facebook, and Twitter. But since all these guys provide OAT, it's super easy to add them. So we'll add them for you, we'll test them, and you just do that by click of a button. But obviously, if we don't provide one, again, GitHub's modular, so you provide your own integration for whatever network that you want to use. And obviously, you know, do a pull request and give it to us afterwards. Um, yeah, so that's with uh, social login enabled, right? So you can you get the options there. So obviously, OWA provides you with a mechanism for doing role-based uh, authorization, right? So and you can do grants to uh, third-party clients as well. So I'll show this through the demo. So I'm not going to go much into detail about this. Uh, at the moment, but well, basically you, you can assign roles to users and you can assign roles to applications and you can allow third party applications to access certain roles on your behalf. And users when they log in, uh, they get asked whether or not, so do you want to give permissions to the to third party application to access your, you know, your user profile or whatever it is they're asking for it. So as I said, you know, SDKs at the moment, 
Java speaking, Java focused, it's Java and Java E that we've got right at the moment. So tight integration with Wildfly, right? And Java E. So basically, what we want is that you you have your existing uh, WAR and you want to uh, add authentication to that. You don't even have to crack it open or anything. You just do some configuration through Wildfly and it will do that for you and it will start linking it up to Keycloak. And uh, obviously we've got JavaScript libraries for HTML5. So mobile, we're working with the AeroGear guys. So uh, if you don't know what AeroGear is, AeroGear is kind of like JBoss focused on mobile, right? They do loads of stuff there. So for anyone doing mobile development, have a look at AeroGear. And they will give us a hand and uh, do some SDKs for us. So just a kind of like a rough idea of what the core model inside uh, Heathrow is, right? So you have, it's all multi-tenant, right? So you've got multiple realms. Each realm has its own applications, its own clients, and its own users, right? So you can, you can share users between, or you can share one Keycloak instance between multiple um, organizations or whatever if you want to. Obviously, you probably don't want to do that with it being security, but you might have um, different kind of you might have a separate realm for testing, you might have one for development, you might have one for production, or you might have distinct categories of applications uh, that you want to have their own set of uses and so on. So basically a realm has a whole bunch of config options. Uh, it also has its kind of global realm roles. So a realm role is something that's shared across all applications. That has a bunch of applications, right? An application is something that's seen as a, as a the only difference between an application and the, what we call a client is that a client is a third party application that has to ask permissions from the users to access your roles, while an application just gets the permission straight away because an admin has said this is an application that belongs to this Keycloak server. It's not an external application. So, if you want to use this uh, with JavaScript libraries, you have to set a, um, the permitted web origins. So that's a cross-scripting cross uh, safety mechanism built into browsers. Uh, so you can configure that through there. So it's basically what domains. Uh, so if your application runs on a different domain than your Keycloak server, which it might, well, quite likely will do, then you can say to your browser, well, actually let this script running in this uh, domain talk to uh, Keycloak. <coughs> Otherwise, it wouldn't be allowed to do that for the from the browser's point of view. Um, you also have a set of roles that are specific to each application, right? So that might be uh, a gallery application has um, roles that allows users to view pictures or edit pictures or upload pictures, right? An application also has a scope so a scope is an application being allowed to use roles from other applications, right? So uh, you might have a uh, gallery application that is allowed to send emails in an email application, right? And that, that is then configured through the scopes. So and admin goes and says this application is allowed to do these and these and these things. So clients, pretty much the same as applications except for the fact that they have to ask permission. So, uh, and also they don't have their own uh, roles, right? Because a client is something that accesses an application and uses the roles. It's not something that has it provides its own uh, roles. Again, clients have to have, uh, if they're JavaScript based, they have to set a web origin. And there's also both applications and clients, you have to set a valid redirect URI. So it's a, or a specific thing, but basically it's with, how an application gets a token, right? So it's to make sure that only valid applications can, can get a token and get access. Um, so yeah, so it's got a scope. So an admin goes in and says, you know, this, this client is allowed to do these and these things. So it might say that this specific client is allowed to view pictures, but not edit them, right? So that's what uh, permissions a client is allowed to ask for. Right, so it's not it's not the permissions they will get. The the uh, <coughs> client has to ask the user, "Am I allowed to view pictures?" Right, 
or am I allowed to view your pictures right, on your behalf, right? But an admin says that this application in the first place is allowed to be asked to use. So, all right, so there's users, nothing really, you know, users have roles they're allowed to access, uh, they have some credentials, so passwords, uh, multi-factor authentication setup, and they have a profile. So the profile is something that's gonna be completely uh, configurable, right? So you can decide what, what attributes a profile is built up of and what validation you want to have on your profile. So, as I said, it's R2, this is not a lesson on R2, that will take, you know, half an hour minimum. Uh, but just to give you a rough idea of what happens in R2, so basically a user, so this is all browser based, uh, a user opens a protected page in your application, the application then redirects you to Keycloak through the SDK, um, the login form of Keycloak pops up, the user enters the username and password, um, the user submits this to Keycloak, right? So your application never sees the user's username and password, which is quite important, right? Um, then Keycloak sends a uh, authorization code to, to the application. Uh, so this is one specific flow of the OAuth protocol, it's got many. And the application can then access that for a token. A token is something an application can then use to access uh, services, right? So if it wants to, your JavaScript application wants to access a uh, RESTful service, it passes this token on. And that token contains, um, you know, so it contains basic standard kind of JSON web token, and it also contains a signature, right? So the token contains the subject, so basically your user ID. It contains an expiration time, so uh, you know how long this is valid for, right? That might be an hour, or a week, or whatever, right? It's up to the admin and configures the realm to set these settings of how long should a token last. It also contains, this is a specific extension to Keycloak, so we have all the access permissions uh, for that token, right? So what the client has asked for to obtain and what permissions the user has. So basically, what is what does this token give access to? And that's all added to the token uh, along with the signature, right? So that means that uh, a service doesn't even have to talk to the Keycloak server to be able to verify that this uh, request is valid. Right, it can just see, so right, is this allowed to view pictures? Uh, it expires, but okay, tomorrow that's fine, right? And it checks the signature, and it's all okay, so it doesn't have to talk to the, the Keycloak server, right? Yeah, so basically, a user accesses a resource, and the application then passes this token to the service to show that this is a valid, uh, valid request. So, one key aspect is, password never given to an application or to a client, right? All it gets is a token, a token that can be expired and uh, can be invalidated, right? Um, so I reckon I'll probably touch on this, but you know, so client has to ask permission from users, right? Um, so this, the flow is slightly different, right, when it, when a client asks. So basically, again, it logs in to, re, to Keycloak. The user submits the credentials, and Keycloak then asks uh, whether or not this application should be given these permissions, right? So in this case, this picture viewer application is asking to view the profile in your account application, and it asks to add pictures and view pictures in your gallery application, right? And the user can then say, oh, yeah, that's fine. Or you can say, no, <laughs> no thanks, right? And it can also go back, like you can say, accept, and then the next day go and say, well, actually, I don't want this application to access this anymore. And they can just go and revoke the application and that token. Yeah, so basically, it's the same. Once the user's accepted, it carries on with the same flow, right? So the application's given a code, which the application can then swap for a token, right? Right, so I've got, as I said, you know, I want to show this off. I don't want to talk to you, bore you about the details, right? I'll show you how it works, and you decide yourself if you want to use this. So that's why the demo is quite extensive, right? 
So I've actually, uh, my slides is my application. So through the JavaScript to SDK and two lines of code to my slides, I've made this into an application that you can log into. So I've set the uh, address for the Keycloak server. And then I have to, the first thing, so I've got a fresh Keycloak out of the box. This is just, I've started the standalone, or the startup script, and that's it, right? Um, the first thing I need to do is create myself a rel. So I log into the admin console. And then I just create myself a realm. I just call it demo realm. So I'll then configure the application and tell him what realm belongs to. And then I have to create an application inside uh, Keycloak to represent this uh, application. So I call that demo app. So applications can be enabled and disabled and so on. Um, so I need to, since these slides are running on GitHub I.O. and the Keycloak server is um, running on RH Cloud, so OpenShift, I have to basically tell the JavaScript, or tell the browser that uh, this piece of JavaScript is allowed to talk across origins. Uh, so I basically just tell it that that domain is allowed. So redirect URI is something that I should set, but I'm not going to set it now. It's basically saying that um, the uh, GitHub, so only an application on this specific URL is allowed to be given a code, right? So once you've enabled HTTPS and so on, it's, it's pretty safe that the user will never get fooled by a middleman or whatever to, to, to send a, a code to an invalid application. All right, so I need to create myself a user. So by default, the user, you can't log into it. So I need to set a temporary password for the user. So when you do that, the user has to change the password on the next login. And then I need to create some roles, right? Because what, what's the point if it doesn't have anything to access, right? So I'll just come up with a basically a realm role. And we have things called composite roles. So basically a role can contain, can consist of many roles, which is a, a nice way for you to be able to, so it's an alternative to groups basically, right? So you can say that a, a gallery user allowed to view, edit, and uh, delete pictures. And that also allows you to then change that individual role without having to muck about with what roles are assigned to users and so on later on. So I'll select the demo app that I created, and I'll just create a role there as well. And finally, I can control the scope of the application. So by default, an application can, can access all of its own roles, right? Because it wouldn't make sense to have an application that can't access the roles that the application is built up for. But you have to, if it wants to use uh, realm roles or global roles or roles for other applications, you have to give it permission to that, right? So we can give it permissions to use the realm role. And we can say for the account application, it can view the profile. And then we also have to go to the user and say that the user is actually allowed to have these roles as well, right? So I say this user is allowed to use the realm role. Uh, again, so the account permission is actually granted by default. Uh, you can change that default, but uh, it doesn't make sense to have a user that's not allowed to manage its own account and view its own profile, right? Uh, and then let it use the app role in the demo app, right? 
So I could probably have chosen better names for these roles, right? So after all, I could have chosen uh, a gallery application. I could have chosen the role, as I said, you know, re view pictures, right? Or upload pictures. So basically that's it. That lets me log in. Should do. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't set the password for the application either. Uh, at the moment, all applications are required to set a password, but it doesn't make sense for a browser-based application because then the password is right there anyway. So it's not. A so I need to go back to the admin console and basically just set a temporary password. So you know, it doesn't make it doesn't matter if that is a password that someone can just rip off because the redirect URIs and so on guards another application from using them. But if you have things like you have a, a server side application, you can use the password uh, for a way for the application to authorize itself towards Keycloak. So for a public application, so a mobile phone or a uh, HTML5 application, obviously there's no way of safeguarding a password uh, because all the source is there for people to download so they'll be able to easily see the password, right? So you can't use that for a way for the application to say to keep up, I am who I say I am. That's why you use the redirect URI instead. So it's slightly less secure, but that's the trade-off of having a public client, right? Now then, thanks for that, whoever helped me out, by the way. All right, so on my first login, I'm asked to change my password, right? So that's it, so now, this is what the application is given. So it's given this token. Uh, so you can say, see that this token is, uh, is that okay for everyone? So that's, uh, it says who the token is issued for. It has an expiration time. It says the subject is this guy called Demo. Um, and it's got the roles that these users allowed to access. Um, all right, so it's allowed to view the profile and it's allowed the app role and so on. And you can quite easily kind of change what, say, if I wanted to say that this application is no longer allowed to ask for the realm role, right? So the next time the application tries to get a token, uh, it won't be given that, right? So now the realm role is gone. Uh, the user's also got a profile, but seeing I didn't fill in anything, the so first name, the last name, and so on, it's, that's basically it. Um, but again, you know, if I go and set a first name and last name, go and refresh the uh, profile, now we've got a username, a first name, and last name, right? Um, so basically, this is with three lines of code to this application. We've got all of this stuff, right? So I can enable uh, registration, so you can let users uh, self-register, right? So that's, again, it's just a click of a button. And uh, you go to... Um, then there's these things called default role. So default role is basically something that all users that are newly created are given, right? So I can say that, again, you know, the view profile is automatic, right? You can remove it if you want to, which means that they won't get that. Uh, and I can say, you know, it should be allowed to access this app role. <coughs> so now if I log out, log back in,
yeah, I forgot to press the save button. So when you do changes, you need to click the save button basically to confirm that you, you want to do that. Uh, let's try that again. Yeah, so now we've got the option to register, right? And uh, at the moment, since this is like an alpha one release, uh, this profile is fixed, right? And all fields are required, there's no validation, whatever. But this is all going to be configurable in the, uh, before we reach the beta. So I register user, it's immediately logged in. And now you can see I've got a different profile, right? Um, and obviously, you know, if you decide down the line that you don't want users to self-register anymore, you can just go in and disable the self-registration and it will disappear from the login forms, right? Uh, as I said, you can change the theme, uh, which we try to make as simple as possible for people to make it fit into their own applications, right? So you can just go and you can choose for the login forms or for the uh, account uh, self, there's account management console for users to manage their own consoles. You can choose what themes they have. And you, this is basically just a, a folder with a couple of uh, style sheets and, and some templates and stuff. And you can overwrite, you can overwrite like messages if you want to. So, um, you can add internationalized labels or you can replace the login form where it says insert your username, you can replace that with whatever you want and you can replace individual pieces of strings on on the uh, page and it all falls back to this base theme that we have uh, so it basically extends from that and you can override individual templates or you can override individual style sheets or you can override messages uh, and you can add images and so on right? And we will have an option to go and upload basically a zip file of your theme through the admin console as well. So I can show that if I set this sunrise team, which was done by a web guy, um, if I then log in, this is how it looks like now, right? I can just go back and say, well, actually, just go back to the key club theme. And now it looks like this. So, um, there's these things called uh, required actions. So an admin can uh, basically go in and find a user, say that next time this user logs in, he has to update his profile. So if I then, basically, it's next time it tries to get a token or re-log in uh, and basically since there's no validation added I can just submit the same form again but um, you, once you've added you could change your validation right so for what is what's a required field for this realm you can say that you know now people have need to have a date of birth as I said before and then you can go and select all users all users the next time they require to update their profile right and now they would have to put in the date of birth, right, to be able to log in. Um, you can enable social login, uh, which is again, you know, it's quite simple. Uh, there's a little bit of complexity because you have to, not only do you have to add it to Keycloak, which is quite simple in Keycloak, but you have to go and configure it in whatever social provider. You have to configure an application that basically is allowed to ask for users' profiles. So that would be the equivalent of a client in Keycloak. Uh, and that varies from what social provider you have. GitHub, super simple. Uh, Facebook and Google, you know, not quite so simple and they kind of make it a little bit confusing as well. So that's why we added to the documentation exactly what steps do you need to do for each individual provider. And we will keep that updated, right? So both Facebook and, and uh, Google recently changed the consoles around a bit. Google changed it massively, Facebook did it a little bit. Right, so buttons moving and stuff. So we'll figure that out for you. We'll change it to, for you and tell you what, you know, when there's a new release of Keycloak, you'll get told what it is. So you don't have to go and hunt down. Um, uh, so if you wanted to 
So they obviously claim that adding social login is really easy for your website if you want to do that yourself, right? You just use the SDKs and so on. Well, what happens if there's five or ten that you have? Then you have to keep it up to date whether or not they change their APIs or whether or not they change their console of how you register and so on. So using Keycloak, you'll get all that for you, right? We'll do that for you. We'll make sure that it works and uh, we'll also make sure the documentation is up to date. Um, so I'll try, we'll basically add uh, GitHub since that's the easiest one to configure. Um, so I also say that on the first login, users are required to update their profile because not all social networks will actually give you all the details you need. So this is up to you to enable or to say uh, if you want to, right? So if you want to make sure that all users, even though they log in through a social provider, they fill in their full profile on your site. It will be pre-filled with whatever we can fetch from that social provider, but there might be missing things, right? So for instance, Twitter doesn't give you an email address. So that means the social login is enabled. We have to go and then also add a provider. So uh, again, these things are, uh, there's, there's an SPI for writing these yourself if you want to add them. Um, it's just relatively simple to do if you know, if you understand the over 2 protocol, you can add, say you wanted to add LinkedIn, you could probably add that in an hour. So and then I have to go to GitHub. <coughs> right, I'll just create one from scratch. That's more fun, isn't it? Uh, we'll call it KC Demo. Uh, basically, the uh, homepage URL is the URL of your uh, website, right? So let's call that keycloak.org. Uh, and then you need the callback URL, which is the same as the redirect URI I was talking about in Keycloak. Um, so we have a single URL for all realms and for all uh, stuff, so it's easy for you to remember. It's displayed right there in the admin console, and it's also in the documentation that shows you how you'd find that yourself right so that's just a simple copy and paste they're uh, demanding aren't they there we go so all I need is this client ID and the client secret and I'll just copy and paste them into the admin console. And that's it. Now users should be able to log in with GitHub, right? So try to log out, log back in. Now we've got this nice option of logging in with GitHub. So basically then KC demo wants to uh, access our personal user data and our email addresses. You'll let the application do that and there you go. Right? So uh, since I asked the user to have to update the profile on the first, so this is only on the first login with uh, a social network. Uh, and GitHub provides you with a name, a single name, not a first name and last name. Uh, so you can kind of edit that if you want to. Um, yeah, so in the future we'll also let uh, users have basically to use the same account uh, and be able to log into the same account with a username and password if they want to, or they can log into the same account with GitHub, or they can log into it with Google or whatever, and they can add and remove what social providers they want to, to use. And that's all through the uh, account management console that we have. It's not something we have now, but we'll have it pretty soon. And that will also, there will be an option once you get to this point, you'll be an option, well, hang on a minute, do you already have an account? Do you want to link this with another account or do you want to create a new account, right? All right, so there we go. So I'm logged in with, um, with GitHub. 
there isn't anything in this profile there isn't anything that shows uh, what the user is logged in with because we want to try to keep the profile in a normalized way so your application can access access it in the same way right so if you were ad adding uh, your own application you had your own database where you had your different names for usernames and passwords and so on no no usernames first names and so on and then you added Google and you added Twitter and so on then you have different attribute names for the same things right so now you have to code that into your application but we put that all into a, a normalized form for you right so we have uh, multi-factor authentication right so um, I've now decided that this uh, demo slides up contains super sensitive information and so on and we don't want to have any breaches of lost passwords and things like that so we'll now say that all users have to use uh, one-time passwords um, so again you know that's the only option we have at the moment is one-time passwords but we'll have SMS and email and those and various different options there in the future and again that's done in a modular way so if you want to add your own that's fine right so if I remember what user actually told no all users should be able to do that now so if I log in now I'm asked to set up Google Authenticator so that's the only one that we provide at the moment but there will be choices on this form for users to say so this realm has asked you to provide a multi-factor authentication uh, what do you want to use right it's up to you you can use uh, the admin behind this realm decided that you can use these and these and these mechanisms right and it's up to you to then choose which one is most convenient for you so all I need to do is I've got basically Google authenticator on my phone and um, so I just go to that and I say set up a new account and it's all, you know, the instructions are there. So scan this barcode and then I put in this one time password, right? So that's that. We have an account management console. Um, So now again, I have to do the one-time password. Right, so at the moment, uh, you can uh, update your profile, you can reset your password, uh, and you can add and remove authenticators. So I've now removed the authenticator from this user. But since the realm is requiring me to have one, the next time I log in, it will again ask me to set one up. So I'll do. I'll just go and remove that because it's quite annoying to have to provide the one-time password all the time. So we'll also add an option, um, basically, where users can choose to remember a particular machine. So, if you log into, for instance, Google and you use uh, one-time passwords for Google, they will they will have an option saying, you know, remember this machine, give it a name, and then now you won't have to uh, to provide a one-time password for the next 30 days, uh, and we'll have that option as well. And then you can go into the account management console and you can see what machines you've allowed to uh, bypass the one-time password, or basically who's allowed to remember that. And you can just remove that and say next time you'll have to use the one time password when you access that machine. Right? Can you inherit that through your social login? Uh, yeah, so if you add the uh, requirement for one time password here, you have to provide one to Kiko. Right? So um, even if you have a one time password in Google, uh, Kiko will still ask you for one. But can I use the Google? Uh, that would be pretty cool so uh, I don't actually know I don't know if Google would provide you with the details to let you know that this user is used to that I don't know but that's certainly something I will look at because that a bit less smooth if people have to provide in two one time passwords but I'd imagine in a way I kind of imagine that 
if you go to the extent of enabling the requirement of a one-time password to your uh, realm, it's something sensitive and you're probably not going to be using social login anyways. Right, so that's kind of my gut feeling, but I don't know. But if the thing is that if people want to do it, then it's a valid use case, then, you know, if Google would tell us that the users used multi-factor authentication, that's fine, right? So we can piggyback on that. So just to show what happens if this application is now uh, a third-party application instead. Um, so instead of creating an application as I did before, I create a OAuth client. Right, so I just, um, I need to set the password as well. This is changing, uh, this password stuff, this is just temporary. So basically we'll, the next thing is we'll generate one for you. And uh, I'm pretty sure we'll let kind of, you, through the admin console, you can mark an application as a public application. So in which case it won't actually require a password at all. Uh, and then I basically, since I set the same password, I'll just need to change the client ID. Um, so if I try to log in now, what will happen is that it will go straight through, if I can remember my password. Uh, the reason why it does that is because it's not actually given any permission. So who cares if it gets a token because the token isn't valid for anything. Uh, so there isn't any permissions to ask the user for, right? And it's the same thing, like, so it couldn't load the profile because it doesn't have the access to do so. So I can go in and go into the scope for that client and I can say that it's allowed to ask for the realm role. Uh, it's allowed to ask to view the profile. So by default, an application or a client will ask, will basically ask for the full scope that you've configured it to have. Uh, you can also send a query parameter from the application to limit the amount of scopes that you, you want, which is kind of like a good practice if you're writing an application that you, you start out with asking users for as minimal amount of things as possible, right? You don't go the Facebook way and ask for absolutely everything on your phone, right? Because people are going to stop using your application if, they, if you're asking to access everything they own. <coughs> but if an application asks you to, you know, do something that makes sense for the application, then, you know. So if you're writing a uh, picture application, ask to view pictures. Don't ask to send emails, right? Because that's the most likely way you'll get people to give that application permission and actually use your application. Um, so, yeah, so if I log back in, did I give it the permissions? Yeah. Well, yeah. So, basically it says, right, so demo client request access to view profile in uh, the account. Uh, it didn't actually ask for the realm role because that user doesn't have the realm role. So it will only ask for the permissions that the uh, client is allowed to ask for and the uh, roles that the user is actually given as well. Um, so if the user accepts that, that's fine. Um, you go back and you see now it managed to load the profile and uh, it now has uh, access to the view profile in the account application. Um, yeah, that's it for the demo. Right, so what's next? Um, before we start doing testing and uh, security uh, validation and so on, uh, we're going to be adding more features. Uh, we're going to 
uh, improve on the code base uh, and uh, update documentation and so on and so on. And some key features that we're missing is um, audit uh, and um, basically federation and brokering of, uh, of logins. So uh, that includes like being able to authenticate a user against an LDAP server uh, or even authenticating user towards another Keycloak realm. So a user could have a username and password in one realm and basically log in via that, but all the roles and so on is managed by the other realm. So that's a way to have a single user have basically one password on many places. Uh, so at the moment we only support a, a small part of the OA2 um, specification and the OpenID Connect is an extension that gives a lot more features to your, your application in, in a standard way and we want to support that and we want to support SAML for enterprise application and for, you know, for, for integrating legacy into your single sign-ons and so on and also for those that want to use a more complicated protocol if they choose to and loads more stuff basically um, so the website is keycloak.org uh, if anyone wants to download it. Uh, the first alpha has been released. Uh, we'll probably be doing releases at least once a month until we hit the beta, so adding new features and so on. Uh, we hang out on Keycloak on Freenode, uh, and there's also a, a Keycloak uh, users mailing list <laughs> uh, that's on the JWAS mailing list uh, page, so basically if you just search for that, or you can find a link on our website. Right, that's it. Any questions? So, um, how do you kind of expect to have this bit of a uh, conversational question? How would you envisage people using Keycloak? So, um, would you expect them to run it on OpenShift or to deploy it to Wildfly or JWAS EAP or do they run it standalone in their own environment? Up to you. Right? So, all so the we have an OpenShift cartridge, makes it super easy to get one up and running on OpenShift uh, and that would be a support way of doing it. We have a strong integration with Wildfly, uh, so you can run it as, so basically we have, the Wildfly has uh, two distributions, so it's got the traditional Wildfly Java E uh, distribution, but we also have a slimmed down kind of Wildfly version, so if you run a run Keycloak standalone, it runs on top of Wildfly, but it's a very slimmed down version of Java E. Well, it doesn't have any Java E, basically, uh, of the Wildfly core. And then we also let you run it uh, on Wildfly if you want to, together with your uh, WAS and so on. Or it's, you know, so you can, you can have it on a separate server, you can have it together with Java E applications, uh, or you can run it on OpenShift. Right? So um, we also have another project which is a non-Java E thing, which I'll give a talk to about in a few weeks' time. Uh, that runs live uh, Lawrence Keycloak embedded inside it as well. So that's a separate container as well. So we're trying to make it as reusable as possible, right? So the focus is on having services that you can reuse rather than having to do it all. So is that the vision or is that what you can have today? You can have OpenShift Wildfly today, uh, the full profile of Wildfly, but the core will the smaller wildfire will come. Uh, and you can use this other project, uh, but uh, that's even long before alpha. So. What about EFD, version 6, 2, for example? It's been written to work in EFP 6, but that depends on whether or not there's a need to, to add it as a product decision. It depends. If there's anything. Is that part of the If there's uh, any JBoss products that need it, we will make sure it runs on EAP 6.3. I guess it's one of them coming. So it might work by accident, if you see what I mean. It's you can't see why it wouldn't work, but... It would only work it. on EAP 6.3 if someone really wants it. Uh, okay, so, so that could be an internal project. Okay. You can get it to work on it, because it's just... You can deploy it as a WAR, and it should work, but it's not supported. Yeah, well. I appreciate what you're saying. You've not tried it, so you wouldn't be surprised. Okay, it's it's sure. I actually think there's guys that's tried it. So the the guys, uh, Wildfly guys, are looking at using it. So they have tried it. Yeah, so you head to the forum, I guess. Try it, head to the forum, 
Yeah, yeah if you have any problems, go on yeah. Keycloak on Freenode or the mailing list, and we are basically falling over ourselves with talking to you. <laughs> so, uh, any other questions? Just, just a simple one. Let's say um, I administrate the school, and I have lots of new students start all at once. I have a spreadsheet, and I need to create users for all of these. Is this kind of a bulk update version instead of 400 times through the same streets? Yeah. Uh, not at the moment. There's now so there's a single, a, right? Kind of but definitely, right? absolutely, we'll have support for for doing bulk updates, right? Yeah. And at the same time, like I imagine, we'd do that in a in a modular way. So if you want to import a list from, uh, so we might support something like a JSON format, right? Mm -hmm. But if you wanted to do it from Excel and you wanted to write that piece, right? Which would be something mm -hmm. as simple as read in an Excel data dump it out as a JSON, we'll import it for you. Yeah. Do a pull request, we'll probably accept it, right? That sounds like something people quite like to do sometimes, or, or get it from LDAP. Yeah, so, you know, like, if we get enough demand for it and we have time to do it, we'll do it. But if you do it for us, uh, you know, we'll buy you a beer and we'll yeah, pull it in and support it for you, right? And the other was a bit more technical, was um, what you're relying on for the security, because you talked about the Let's assume that your IP, you're on Wi-Fi, so we can grab that and scoop your IP. We can um, intercept your DNS requests and redirect those somewhere else. So is it SSL you're relying on? Yeah. When you ask to set up the link to a certain server, yeah, so you're authenticating that that server's there. The OR2 specification is only secure on a uh, secure link, right? So it requires SSL. That's for the client login, for the end user to, when you've said require it, you're logging in. Anytime you send... you get another server, which is where your hosting is checking. Um, yeah, so anytime you send that? this token, you yeah. should send that on uh, an HTTPS connection. Yes. Obviously... So if, I, if I take over the server and pretend to be that server, and may choose not to do it, yeah, but your browser should make sure, right? Before well, it sends it. If I change the URI to HTTP to the rest, then maybe I'll ignore the need for SSL certification to be an yeah. one. Well, that, that is uh, down to. So, for one thing, when you log into a website, right? So, mm -hmm. um, they, the website has a URL, right? So, uh, if you log in via. So, you should log into an HTTP site. Right? Yeah. That will then take you to Keycloak. Keycloak will then redirect this code back and will only redirect back to the URL that the admin has configured inside Keycloak. Right? So that will go to an HTTPS endpoint. Well, I can that read where that's redirecting, then I can mess with the DNS to say, oh, he's asking to be. No, because it's HTTPS, thing. right? So it's, it's, it's saved yeah. by the browser. The browser will check. And it will check based on the certificates and so on. But and to make go sure there, it's still right. fire off the DNS request, which looks at the DNS, because I've got control of DNS, I run my own DNS server and say, so the address of the server you just asked me to go to, to do the secure login is, yeah, have an IP address. Um, yeah, but the data is encrypted, right? And there's a certificate that's verified. So you can verify the data coming down is from the, the server that sits on the domain that uh, has that certificate, right? Right. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> well, that's how but HTTPS I works, right? So we don't okay. provide. We don't, we're not doing HTTPS, right? So I'm not behind HTTPS, right? So that's secure on its own. Yeah. So uh, if you want to know if HTTPS is secure, then you know, if there's if there's problem with HTTPS, then there's not anyone can do anything. Yeah, but right? normal, in a normal scenario, you're just relying on the client and talking to the, the server which, which authenticates to say I am who I say I am and you get your browser card to the screen whereas you're going off to yet another server so you, you're adding complexity and to what extent you trust those other things whether they're real or not might be a concern I think for me. I, I don't it, understand. It may all just work and have that in the protocol. Maybe we should take this one offline, really. Yeah, I don't it's really see the problem. So, like, if you should trust an HTTPS endpoint, so be your application through the web browser, yeah. you trust that that's 
right? So when you talk to your application, HTTPS, Acme, dot .inc, or whatever it is. But if I was trying to set them down in the middle, then I'd be trying to pretend to be that, and then on another back channel, I would be but sending the same credentials. Yeah, but that's how certificates come in, and encryption comes in, right? Because yeah. it makes sure that that basically through the uh, by signing the, the request and by encryption, you know that that comes from that server. That's the same thing with Keycloak, right? So you know that you're talking to that Keycloak server, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah we can take that offline sure. if you want to know more about it. But any other questions? Nope. Okay, in case, thanks for the talk. Thank you. Thank you.